Hey, this is Misty, and as promised, this is your video review for your upcoming Unit 2 exam. Now, don't forget what I told you. Please take out a piece of paper, write some notes. Just listening to me talk is not going to make this stick in your head. You're going to need to turn a lot of this stuff into flashcards. You're going to need to quiz yourself. Make sure you're reinforcing what I'm telling you. All right? But if you know everything in this video, you should get 100 on the test. So, at the beginning of this unit, when we started looking at the ancient world, the first thing we started looking at was the environment and the impact of things like natural barriers and how they impact people. One of the most impactful, um, you know, natural barriers or parts of the environment that can have a huge impact on civilizations is mountains. That's a big one. And um, one of the things we looked at when we started was the impact that mountains had on Greece. If you take a look at that map in the top right, you can see that Greece is covered in mountains. And what historians say, a lot of people argue that it is the fact that Greece has this mountainous geography, that is what leads Greece to form city-states. It does not have one uniform culture, one uniform government, centralized government. Instead, these small little cities end up developing their own governments and, to a certain extent, their own culture. You know, although all Greek city-states generally spoke Greek and, you know, worshiped the same gods, in other ways, they're very, very different places. Um, the two that most often get compared and contrasted is Sparta and Athens. Sparta, you should remember from when we saw that movie, right, 300, Sparta is a military culture. I mean, that was it. They were all about fighting and, and killing, you know, for the empire and all that. Very, very militaristic. Athens, on the other hand, although it did have a strong military, very good navy, by the way, um, it, but that wasn't all it was. It's really what Athens is most well known for is its art and culture. Beautiful, um, you know, beautiful uh, uh, architecture, um, great sculpture, and so on. Um, in addition, it is also the place that invents the idea of democracy. And we're going to talk a little bit about more about that later in this video. But again, um, the fact that it develops city-states traces right back to the fact that this is this mountainous geography that doesn't allow for, um, you know, these cultures to easily communicate and, and get on the same page. All right, another mountain range that you should be familiar with, that you should be aware of, is the Himalayas. The Himalayas are actually the highest mountain range in the world, and they separate India from China. So just know that that's where that mountain range is, and that's the reason why these two areas are not going to invade each other. It's just who, that keeps them very much, very separated. And the, finally, of course, the, the other mountain range we spent a lot of time talking was the Andes. And remember, Incas, Andes, Incas, Andes, Incas, Andes. It is the Incan Empire that grows up along this Andes Mountains, right? Remember that? That was the city of Machu Picchu. I told you, they don't look up at the clouds. They look like at them, like straight at them, because this is an empire that was located on a mountain range. All right, so as much as people are impacted by the environment, one of the big themes of this unit was the fact that humans have a lot of control over the environment, that humans can change the environment so that the environment meets their needs. So let's take a look at some examples. Um, first, we'll start with terrace farming. You see that picture at the top left, right? That you're in a mountainous geography, and you got to grow food. What do you do? Well, you change the environment. You cut steps into the mountain to create flat land so that you can grow more food. Another example of how to adapt the environment is to build aqueducts, all right? That's that picture in the top right. Uh, in that picture, that is uh, where they use this in the Roman Empire, they use this in the Aztec empires, that you have a big city, you need more fresh water. What do you do? You build aqueducts, you bring the water from the mountains into your city. So I think you guys remember, remember I told you Spanish, agua, think agua, aqua, that's, you know, water. All right, so on the bottom left, that is an example of a chinampa. That was another way that we see these civilizations change the environment. You had the Aztec civilization. Its capital was located in the middle of a lake. 
well, you got to have more land. You got to be able to grow food. What do you do? You create these floating islands where you can grow food. And this is how they're able to feed their population. Uh, and finally, another example of adapting to the environment is the Mayans. If you look at the bottom right, the Mayan empire is in the middle of a rainforest, right? The Mayans a civilization was in the Yucatan Peninsula, right, in Mexico. And this is very, very dense rainforest. And this is a people that said, oh, we're going to just clear it out. And they just cut down all the trees. They cleared space. And they ended up building these massive pyramids, these amazing civilizations, right in the middle of the rainforest. Um, and that was how they changed the environment to allow for their civilization to grow and develop. All right. So um, from there, we went into, again, one of the most important ways that civilizations will adapt to, to the environment, that they will change the environment to meet their needs. One of the biggest changes, the most important changes that these empires make to the environment is to build roads, right? And I even made it like a separate lesson virtually about it, is the fact of how important roads are, how important it is to be able to travel throughout your empire. If you are going to rule effectively, you need to be able to travel, you need to build a road network. So um, why do you need a road network? We'll, we'll run through these things again. First, cultural diffusion, right? You've got to... Um, if, for example, let's take a look at the top right. That's the Roman Empire, right? And this is a photo of some of the Roman roads very early on in the empire. And you can see this is an empire that expand, extends through three continents. The thing is huge. It, it goes all the way around the Mediterranean Sea. The Mediterranean Sea, you can see it's labeled there in the picture. It's that huge body of water right there in the center. And it's going to wrap all the way around that Mediterranean Sea. It includes Europe, Asia, Africa, and the, by building a road network, you're allowing different parts of your empire to more easily communicate, to have more contact with each other. And that is going to allow for cultural diffusion within your empire, and that's going to help you unify your people and spread ideas throughout your empire. In addition, it also allows for trade. Now, that means trade inside your empire as well as trade to other empires and other people in other lands. So one of the ones we take a look at is the Silk Road. Remember, the Silk Road isn't necessarily a road per se. It's actually a series of trade routes. And these trade routes connect the Roman Empire through the Middle East into Asia, uh, sorry, into India, and finally into China. So it does connect Europe to Asia, but, you know, as I said, all throughout. And in fact, Africa also used to connect into that Silk Road network as well. But um, it connects, it runs right through these areas, this, this road network, um, they, sorry, this trading network. And uh, so that was really important because, of course, trade is going to allow you to have that greater, uh, greater trade, greater cultural diffusion with other, with other cultures, and also more money, which will help you, uh, certainly makes your empire stronger. Uh, and then finally, why else do you need roads? Well, to move your military. Uh, the larger your network, that's a huge border to defend. You have to be able to move your troops very quickly if there's any kinds of problems within your empire to get them where they need to be fast. Um, that's also another benefit of a road network. But however, as good as roads are, and they are pretty fabulous, you can't be without them, one of the negatives of a road network, one of the negatives of connecting to others is the fact that it can spread disease. In the ancient world, the big example of this is the Black Plague. Um, but, you know, there were other plagues as well, you know, that, that came through. But that's the thing is once you're connected to other people, you know, in addition to ideas, in addition to trade, in addition to all the other good things that can come along the roads, you can also have bad stuff like germs and, and diseases. All right. Um, now, uh, the other thing we looked at was some examples of these road networks. So we've already looked at the Roman road network. Um, another interesting example of a road network is the one developed by the Incas. Now, again, the Incan Empire is built in a mountain range. So, you know, they need roads actually more than anybody. That is a really tough environment to, to build a, uh, an empire in. But yet, 
they made it work. Uh, they adapted the environment. So you can see in the top picture, cutting that road network through the mountains, back and forth, back and forth, to allow for messengers to get from one end of the empire to the other. Um, I don't know if you guys remember, in the Americas, in that, in the um, uh, Western Hemisphere, there, you know, in our half of the globe, in the West, there were no horses. There were no horses. Um, they actually are purely from Eurasia. So when there's no horses, if you want to send a message, you got to send a human messenger. So human beings had to run these roads. And where you couldn't build a road, you had to build a bridge. And so they built these rope bridges that connected one mountain to another. And that's how they were able to maintain and run a, this such a large empire across uh, this mountain range. Now, in addition, when we look at road networks, when we look at this idea of communication and things like that, also bear in mind, um, you know, you don't necessarily just need a brick, you know, road, traditional road. Um, you can also think of non-road roads in a sense. Um, this idea that also, you know, water access. Uh, the Mediterranean Sea, for example, I, I told you guys, it was like the super highway of the ancient world. Um, with the Roman Empire, in addition to communicating with other parts of the empire over land, you also could send boats across the Mediterranean Sea, and the boats would also connect you. So you're also able to use that water access for trade and for cultural diffusion, what have you. Um, so the Mediterranean Sea, because again, that Roman Empire, as you can see in the picture, it just wraps all the way around that body of water. For China, they built the Grand Canal. Again, it's not a road, but it functions the same way. Um, what happens is there were a lot of rivers in China that go from east to west, and the Grand Canal connects China from north to south. So it's a really important uh, area for transportation is this Grand Canal that they were able to use. And again, you use it the same way you use roads. It allows for cultural diffusion. It allows for trade and, and all of that. Um, and then finally, the Saharan trade routes. Now, you know, you're not going to be able to build a road through a massive desert. It's just, it's just not possible logistically to build a road there. So, but you still, you know, these trade networks, these caravans that would run through, it really functions the same way. Because, again, remember I told you, it's not like you can cross the Sahara wherever you feel like it. There's only certain paths that you can make it across and, and not drop dead from the heat. So these caravans, you know, that they used with the camels, they were able to cross the Sahara Desert, and that enabled, remember, that enabled that gold salt trade. So that was incredibly important for the, the development of these empires again. And that, you know, it starts with Ghana, later it's Mali, and then finally Songhai. All right, so uh, from there, we took a look at some empires and how empires are run. Um, the first thing uh, is to look at the types of rules that a leader uh, can use, the kind of, you know, what kind of authority the leader is going to have over their people. And the big three I want you to focus on, and these are the most important terms, they're the most common terms, not just for the ancient world. We still use these terms today. We still use these terms today. And the three most common terms that you will hear are autocracy, democracy, and republic. So make sure you know these definitions. An autocracy means one man rule. Now, it does not matter what the man calls himself. He could be a king. He could be a dictator. He could be a warlord. He could be, you know, an emperor. He could be, you know, what, whatever it is, dictator. Eh, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what he calls himself. If it's one person with all the authority, he is an autocrat. He, it is an autocracy. Right? The next example is democracy. Now, a democracy is very, very different. In a democracy, it is the citizens that vote on laws. It is the citizens that really run the government. Now, um, this actually starts in ancient Athens. And in ancient Athens, they had something known as a direct democracy. That is that every single law that had to pass in Athens it was citizens, Athenian citizens, who voted whether or not a particular law would be passed in their city-state. Now, that type of democracy 
is pretty tough in the modern world where you have larger and larger societies. Just logistically, it's a little tough. So today, usually when you refer to something as a democracy, it just means that the citizens have a voice in the government, that the government, you know, uh, answers to the citizens. So we have a little bit more of a looser definition. Traditionally, um, the, the real original definition of democracy, citizens had to actually vote on the laws. Today, usually the way democracy is used, it, it doesn't necessarily have to be to that level. What is much more common today, because like I said, a direct democracy isn't that, isn't that um, isn't, it, it's just not workable, is a republic. You should know what a republic is. America is a republic. And we are a republic because we elect representatives, and the representatives we elect, they are the ones who vote on laws. So it's a specific group. A republic is with a representative. Okay, Your citizens elect representatives, and it is the representatives who make laws. Now, uh, democracy comes out of Greece. The republic comes out of Rome. Okay, What happens is, is before it was an empire, Rome was a republic. When it starts, it is the Roman Republic. And so the citizens of the Roman Republic elected representatives, and those representatives voted on the laws. Now, at a certain point in its history, it changes from the Roman Republic into the Roman Empire. And most of its history, it's an empire. But very early on, it was a republic. And like I said, that's a very influential uh, governmental uh, 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 you know, way to run a government is as a republic. So it's an important, uh, it's an important invention. All right, moving forward. Then we started looking at two uh, philosophies of government that come out of China. And to start, we're going to look at legalism. Now, legalism comes out of the Qin Dynasty. Now, the Qin Dynasty can be spelled two ways. It can be spelled either with a Q or with a CH. It means the same thing. It could be written either way. Um, you may see it one or the other. I think um, I think if you do the, if you end up taking the castle learning, I think on castle learning they use the Q. But they both mean the same thing. It's the Qin Dynasty. Qin Dynasty is the one that that uses legalism. Now legalism, remember I showed you the guy's face, the scary judge, right? Because legalism is where you obey the law or else they're going to come get you. They're going to punish you. And that's the idea. The emperor of the Qin dynasty, his name is Xin Hongji. I'm spelling, again, pronouncing that just horribly. My apologies. Um, but the emperor, he believed that the only way you maintain an orderly society is if you use harsh punishments. It is only the threat of harsh, tough punishments that keep people in line. And he, of course, is, you may remember this from the video, a lot of people, he, he's the guy with the terracotta warriors, that's the, that's the picture on the bottom right. But anyway, he is known, he utilizes legalism, um, that's of course the picture of them throwing, you know, Confucian scholars and burying them alive, supposedly he did that to maintain order, so very, very tough. Um, sometimes it's compared to the Code of Hammurabi, you may not remember that Code of Hammurabi we learned about in very early when we were learning about the River Valley civilizations, if you remember Mesopotamia, um, the Code of Hammurabi was developed back then. Um, that was the first set of written laws, and that was the one that, you know, said, oh, an eye for an eye, and a tooth for a tooth, and, you know, you knock out my eye, I'll knock out your eye. And Again, very, very harsh, tough sentences. If you do something wrong, there's no forgiveness. It's, you know, get back at you. So that's the idea of legalism. Now, something that's very, very different from legalism, which also comes out from China, is this competing idea of Confucianism. Confucianism is very different. Where legalism says that it is punishments that maintain an orderly society, in, under Confucianism, it, he believes that it is family, that it is the relationship of family that is at the core of society, this reverence, this belief in your family, that, you know, respect for these five relationships, and most of them are really based on the family, right? So a father to the son, a father to a wife, the older brother to a younger sibling, right? These relationships, this is what's at the basis of society. That if you are raised the right way, if you're raised to have respect for your elders, if you're, respect, if you're raised to have 
filial piety. That's the letter, that's the word for this. Filial piety is this reverence for your elders, right? Respect for your older, the older people in your family and your ancestors who went before you. If you have that respect for that, that is what creates an orderly society. And that is what the government should strive for. The government should be, the rulers should treat the society like a father would treat a son, like a, you know, a husband would take care of a wife, the older brother to the younger brother, that type of thing. Friend to a friend. It, that is that relationship. And that's at the base of it. And this is this idea of Confucians. Very, very um, important idea. It is um, the basis for the Han government. The Han dynasty, it bases its government around Confucian principles. And um, the Han dynasty actually follows the, the Qin dynasty. And as part of this belief in Confucianism, part of Confucianism is this idea that people can improve themselves through education and as far of, as, and to make sure that the government is run by Confucian principles, they institute a civil service exam. So the idea is, is you cannot take a job with the Chinese government unless you pass an exam. So you can't get a job just because, you know, oh, my father's brother's cousin knows somebody who will give me the hookup. No, 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 it don't work like that. You got to pass the test. You got to know what you're doing. And the test was mostly on Confucian principles. And yet you studied your whole life to pass this test. It was a nightmare. But this actually leads to a very well-run orderly society and it is it is done so well the Han dynasty is um, a very long-lasting well-run government and in fact it is emulated it is copied in future dynasties so our, you know in the medieval period right we talk about the Tang and the Song dynasty they also follow this idea of using Confucianism and using civil service exams because it worked so well for the Han all right um, the other empires we want to look at just really quickly, just Alexander the Great, the big thing he's known for is cultural diffusion. Alexander's empire goes, stretches all the way from ancient Greece um, into ancient Egypt, through the Middle East, and it takes over, it includes the Persian Empire, and continues to India. So what happens is that Alexander's empire ends up developing this, what they call the Hellenistic civilization. This civilization that is a blending of Greek, Egyptian, Persian, and Indian influences into a new type of culture. So it's a great example of cultural diffusion. That's what it's really known for, this Hellenistic civilization. Uh, and then finally, of course, the Roman Empire. Again, I, like I said it earlier, it is a huge empire that stretches across three continents. It is massive. Europe into Asia, the Middle East, and then to North Africa. It spreads throughout all the way around the Mediterranean Sea. And again, this is another example of cultural diffusion. Because remember, with those road networks, with the Roman army, you the Roman people end up... Um, there, there's a lot of cultural diffusion. There's a lot of blending of cultures from all these different parts of the empire coming together. All right, so the next thing we were looking at when we were looking at empires, when we were looking at rulers, was the impact of religion, all right? And the reason we look at religion is because of the impact it has on both society and on government, on politics, right? That very often many rulers will trace their authority to a divine source, whether it's the gods approve of me or I am a god or, you know, I am God's messenger on earth or, you know, what, what have you. The, there's a very strong relationship very often between the, the, you know, some kind of church or, like I said, some kind of divine authority and the ruler. Um, it can lead to cultural unity where there are many examples of a uh, society where everybody has the same religion or at least the majority of people within a particular country have one religion and that shared religion can create cultural unity, can get everybody on the same page. They're all celebrating the same holidays. They all pray to the same God. They all go to the same, you know, uh, religious institutions. However, having said that, um, the problem is, is that it can also cause division right? It can cause war because if you feel like 
your religion is the right religion, it can create tension with people who don't follow your religion. That it can create either division inside your country, if you have people who are non-believers, that sometimes those people can be targeted for uh, discrimination, discrimination or even up to violence if you find people who are non-believers uh, within your borders or sometimes wars outside the country. So either civil wars or, or um, invasions by outsiders. So again, it, you know, it can be good or bad when it comes to unity. Um, it can bring you together or it can tear you apart. All right, so when we looked at religion, we started off by looking at uh, monotheistic religions. The big three in the West are Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. They're not the only ones, but they're the, they have the most impact and the, um, as far as world events. Um, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, they're all considered what they say, like people of the book sometimes, because remember, they all worship the same all-powerful God. The God of the Jews, uh, the, the God that made the covenant with Abraham, is the same God that is worshipped by Christians, is the same God that is worshipped by Muslims. It is one all-powerful God that rules all, it's all-powerful, what have you. Now, that is an example of monotheistic religions. If you are not a monotheistic religion, you are a polytheistic religion. Polytheistic religion has many gods. And the big example of a polytheistic religion that we really focus on is Hinduism. Hinduism um, traditionally is known to have many gods. And one of the most impactful beliefs of Hinduism um, from a social studies perspective, from a historical perspective, is the belief in a caste system. Uh, that's the triangle that's right there in front of you. The caste system, according to the caste system, as soon as you are born, the moment you are born, you enter a caste and you cannot move. Once you're in, you're done. You are in the caste, you do not move. And so that is what determines your social position. Now, part of Hindu belief is the belief in reincarnation. So the idea is, is if you stay in your caste, you, you know, follow the rules of your caste, which is what they call a dharma, you follow your dharma, the rules of your caste, you do the right thing. When you die, you will be reincarnated and you will come back in a higher caste. So all your hard work in this lifetime will be paid back, you know, will, will come uh, bear fruit in the next lifetime. And so you fulfill your dharma and you'll have a favorable reincarnation. Things will go better in the next life. And you could see how that would have a huge impact on politics and in society. That if people believe that they are, you know, in the particular caste and they must only have a certain lifestyle and have certain jobs and a certain thing, you could see how that would have a huge impact on the way people are ruled, the way people get along, and, and so on. All right. Uh, in addition to... Uh, Hinduism, the other kind of polytheistic religions we look at are the nature religions. Um, those are the ones that uh, worship the kind of divine nature spirits or what have you. Um, the first is Taoism. Taoism is a Chinese belief. Um, it is either spelled with a D or a T. They're, they're, oddly enough, it sounds exactly the same. You would say it Tao, whether it's spelled with a T or a D, um, means the same thing. So Tao is a member I kept telling you in class of the, the, about the Tao of Pooh, the Tao of Pooh. That's the book. That's the book that I was telling you about. Um, yeah, fat bear, just somehow everything works out for him. That's because supposedly he follows the Tao. At least that's what this author argues. So the Tao is this idea that there is this uh, divine spirit that runs through all things and if you live a life you know in communion with that if you don't fight it and you're you know your things will work out well for you uh shinto is another nature religion um it is in this one this is the nature religion of japan they believe that there are nature spirits um that there are different areas of japan and these areas are of such beauty that um they that where you see these, what the, these are called Shinto gates. So this is the most visible symbol of Shintoism is the gates. So where these gates are located, these are places where the divine realm and the and our realm they kind of they kind of meet. I think is the idea. So 
Again, it's Shinto. The only other version of a nature religion you sometimes hear references to is animism. I think I mentioned this to you briefly, just the idea that animism, um, that's usually what they reference when you talk about the nature religions of Africa or if you're talking about like Native, uh, Native Americans, so the indigenous people of the Americas, um, some of them had a nature religion as well. So some, they refer to that as animism. But again, Taoism and Shinto is the, is the big ones that we really focus on. All right, and of course, the final thing we looked at in this unit was the fall of empires, right? And the big one we looked at was the Roman Empire, but we also, we compared and contrasted the Roman Empire to the Han Dynasty. That's what's most commonly happens. Um, and the reason they're both compared is because both the Han and the Roman Empire had very, very long, stable governments. Like people thought they would never end. They went on and on and really well run for a really long time. But both ended up falling. Both came to an end at the hands of foreign invaders, um, nomadic people that invaded. Uh, in China, you know, they come from the north and in um, the uh, Roman Empire, remember that was all the Visigoths and the Vandals and all these, the Huns and all them attacking. And if you remember, as we discussed in class, you know, warfare invasion obviously is going to have a role in, you know, 99.9% .9 of the, of, you know, the times where an empire falls, it's going to fall to, you know, some kind of invader who conquers you. But especially if it's a very long standing empire, there's always been invaders around. What now gave them you know, why, why now are they successful and not earlier? And very often it has to do with other factors that, that play a role as well. So very commonly, some of the common factors that you're most likely to see with the fall, especially of long-standing um, important empires, are things like division, whether it's political division, that the government is split, like something like what we saw in the Roman Empire, where you had, you know, a Western Roman Empire and an Eastern Roman Empire, and they split the empire in half, and, the, you know, the two halves ended up, um, although it allowed the Eastern Roman Empire to continue, remember that's the Byzantine Empire, that split ends up hastening the fall of the Western Roman Empire, brings the fall of the Western Roman Empire faster, that split of the empire, that ma that political division. But in addition to political divisions, you also have social divisions, where, you know, if your people are not on the same page and you have too many civil wars and things like that, that will also bring apart, that, that also hastens the end of an empire bad leaders, right? You have the wrong person in charge. Economic problems, of course. Remember, we talked about how important trade is to the strength of an empire. The opposite is also true. If you're broke, that will make you very weak. And then finally, natural disasters, things like, you know, whether it's really bad storms or things like that, or things like um, a really bad plague that will kill off your population. All right, with that, we are done. I Hopefully, you took some notes. But that is, if you know everything that I talked about, if you have that all memorized, if you understand all that, you should do really, really well in your test, all right? Best of luck to you, and I will see you in class.